Welcome to tonight's live stream. I'm going to get started in a minute. Just want to let everybody know that the stream is going on. What's going on, Little Miss Firecracker? Reloaded. And everybody else out there. What's going on, Steve? I'll Mac. Glad to see you here. And I'm going to get into tonight's topic. And far side of the fan, D Rock. And then uh, I'm going to get into tonight's topic. And tonight's topic was inspired by a David Carroll video called The Cloud Over Colored America. And I was going to do my own follow-up to this video. Unfortunately, I got real busy over this week doing different things like putting together the John Haynes comic script and working on getting these 2021 books together. I'm starting to get ready to do the final edits on those. And I didn't have a chance to do my response video to David Carroll's brilliant video, The Cloud Over Colored America. Now, in this video, The Cloud Over Colored America, your David Carroll talked about how black people really are anti-intellectual. And that anti-intellectualism is something I touched myself on in my novel, Spellbound. Now, in Spellbound, I, off, I ta also talk about this spellbound black person, this black person who is obsessed with fitting into the black box that is acceptable to white people. And when it comes down to the spellbound black person, they want to become the stereotypes that white people have created, and they want to adapt this type of personality so that they can fit into that black box that's acceptable to white people so they can find acceptance by white people. So when it comes down to the anti-black intellectualism that David Carroll has talked about, this is something I have experienced myself in my own life because when I was in junior high school and high school and I was out here trying to get the good grades and I was learning how to go out here and try to speak with good diction, I was told that I was talking like a white man or and I was trying to act white. And for years, I always thought that there was something wrong with that whole frame of thinking because when it came down to it in the schools that I was in, not only were people saying that this was not only talking white and acting white, but they were also angry enough to the point where they wanted to get physical because I wanted to go out here and try to get these good grades. And I was trying to learn how to speak in a proper manner. And the whole thing was they were angry because I was not trying to fit into that black box that was acceptable 
that they thought to white people. And I wasn't going to go along with that program. And the reason why I realized they were angry about me, not about things, was because they wanted to go out here and be the type of black that was accept that what they thought was acceptable to white people. And when it comes down to the whole anti-intellectualism in the black community, it's all about this whole social um, race to find white acceptance because most of the black folks out here, they are against intellectualism because they are obsessed with white people. I would go beyond what David Carroll says about how they love white people. No, I would say many are obsessed with white people and that obsession is what drives them to practically transform themselves into caricatures that fit some white person's idea of what black is instead of going out here and trying to create their own standards as related to a black identity and black culture. So when I, as growing up and I made my own observations regarding things, I always looked at it as this whole cloud over black America was actually a spell cast over the minds of many in black America. That's why I came up with the whole concept as related to the novel Spellbound and I came up with that concept after I getting inspired by the Susie and the Banshee song, Spellbound, where she talks about how in one, in one part of the song, following in the footsteps in a, like, in a ragdoll dance, like you're entranced. And the reason why she's saying that is because when you have a person and they're in this entranced in this spell, they're just following along and just going along because they're caught up in the spell. And in the early part of the song, she says, from the cradle bars comes a beckoning voice that says to it, you have no choice. And that was really made me think about black Americans and their whole frame of thinking as related to white people, that many come up from birth believing in this idea that white is better than them and they have to fit into this white world and they have to become the kind of black that makes them feel accepted by white people. And they cannot go out here and form their own form of personality, their foreign own sense of identity. No, for many black people, they believe that in order to be accepted by white people, they have to go out here and become the kind of black person that will be accepted by white people. And they go by the observations that they have in their communities, usually from things they have seen in their single mother households or the households they have with, with their fathers or things that they've seen in the media. So they want to be the kind of black person that they think will be socially accepted. And that's why intellectualism has very little value in the black community because most black people they find higher value in social things than in intellectual things. Because in their minds, what is going to elevate their status in society is getting this social acceptance by white people. So that's why you have people saying they, they really don't want to focus on good grades. That's why they don't want to focus on getting an education. That's why they're not focused on learning how to speak with proper diction or learning how to dress in a manner that makes them appear to be more professional. They don't want to do those things because those things are not going to get them brownie points with these white people and it's not going to help them fit into that black box that will make them acceptable to white people. So you have a lot of black folks out here what they really want to do is they strive for social acceptance and black people have been taught to do that since the days of this civil rights movement because the civil rights movement was originally supposed to be all about black people 
you know, trying to get equal rights under the law. Unfortunately, as the civil rights movement progressed, it changed from being about trying to get equal funds from the government that black people paid taxes into and getting equal resources for things like schools and equal um, benefits for, as related to the government into a quest for social acceptance by white people. And once we started to get into integration, that's when the drive for white social acceptance turned into an obsession and it became all about going into the same place that a white person could go. And when that happened, we started to see the dark, the cloud turn into the dark spell. And that dark spell is just over the minds of so many black people that all they think about is trying to be the black that is acceptable to white. Now, there were some people like this before in the days before Jim Crow, but there, but there weren't that many of them. But after, as we started to go into the civil rights movement, we started going to integration, we saw more and more of people buying into this, into this dark spell and buying into this mindset. And as they bought into this mindset, we started to see more and more black people buying into the idea of needing this white acceptance and needing this white approval and needing to be the kind of black that is acceptable to white. And that's, that's become an obsession for so many black people. And the reason why they're obsessed is again, is because they want to be accepted by white people. And they believe that this acceptance is the, is, has higher value than intellect being intellectual and they think it has higher value than things like building in your own community and seeing a value to things in your own community. And I touched on that in the novel Spellbound in the early chapters. And you can check out Spellbound on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle format. I touched on it in the, in the first couple of chapters in Spellbound, where I talked about Matilda as she was coming home to her neighborhood of Sugar Hill. Now, the reason why I chose the neighborhood of Sugar Hill for part of the setting of Spellbound is because Sugar Hill was one of the wealthiest black neighborhoods in the United States. In fact, in fact, it was the wealthiest neighborhood in the United States. And in fact, it was a place where all of the black elites practically lived and they had all of these beautiful brownstones on on what they call Strivers Row and on other avenues on in Sugar Hill, like Edgecombe Avenue, beautiful brownstones owned by black families. And this was an entire neighborhood that was built by black people. And over the years, because black people didn't value what their parents built and their grandparents built, what happened was you had a lot of blacks out here who wanted this white acceptance and this white approval, and they saw more value in a white man's suburb. So they didn't value their neighborhood, and the neighborhood of Sugar Hill practically fell into disrepair and fell into ruin, and many of those beautiful brownstones that were owned and kept up by black people they went into disrepair. And I remember going with my father to the barbershop back in the early 80s to the mid 80s, and we would drive by those brownstones on our way going to McDonald's after we came from the barbershop. And these brownstones, they were dilapidated, they were run down. But at one time in the 1930s and the 1940s, these were considered the prime real estate for black people. And this was considered the neighborhood for the richest black people, unfortunately, because black people did not value what they built and wanted what the white man had in Long Island and other suburban areas. They let this beautiful neighborhood go down and turn into ruin, practically, 
and it was sadly mostly all gone by the 1980s. And that's why, one of the reasons why I chose that setting in my novel Spellbound, and I set it in 1989, because I wanted to make a commentary on how the, the Spellbound mine could take a beautiful black neighborhood and turn it into ruins because black people, instead of valuing what they built, they wanted to go out here and get what the white man built. And Matilda's in this neighborhood and she only understands the value of that neighborhood, ironically, because her white father it sees the value in that neighborhood. So what happens with the spellbound mind is that you're not thinking about seeing value in yourself. No, you only see value in what some white person sees as valuable, and you only see what's valuable as black as related to a white person. Um, thank you, Mobar, for the super chat. I really appreciate it. T-Mac, glad to see you here. And glad to see you here, Miguel from Jamaica. Wow. Um, all the way over. And when I look at, when I listen to David Carroll talk about, again, the cloud over colored America, I, I, I just thought about my novel Spellbound and everything I was writing in Spellbound. I thought about the Spellbound mindset because the Spellbound mindset, it, it just has you not thinking about trying to become your own distinct black person, seeking out your intellectual aspects, seeking out knowledge. And it tells you that there's only one or two ways to be black. And the spellbound black folks, what they want to do again is fit into that box that's acceptable to white people. So they reduce themselves to becoming a stereotype. And the reason why they want to become a stereotype is because they want the attention of these white people. And they would rather be a white man's court jester than be an intelligent black man or a black woman. So this is why they will go out here and say that being a thug is real being a street dude is real, being a hustler is real, being a dope dealer is real, and being a hood rat or a hoochie mama is real because they want to be that black that is acceptable to white people. And they want to put on this persona because they believe this persona is going to get them the attention of white people. So they don't want to be the guy like myself who's dressed in regular clothes and speaking in a regular fashion because they think that's not going to get the attention of white people. They want to go out here and they want to be the loud guy who's using a bunch of profanity and wearing the sagging pants. They want to be the hood rat wearing the multicolored weave because they think that's going to get white people's attention. And they think that white people will look at that and say, oh, I, I see a black person. But that's not a black person. That's somebody's idea of what a black person is. And what's really sad, ironically, is that idea is one that came from many of these white supremacists back in the days of slavery. So the white supremacists came up with this idea about black people back in the days of slavery that black people were not smart, black people were not capable of intelligence, and black people, they were just out here either, they were extremely loud black women who were out here either being a mammy, or they were out here being a Jezebel, or you had the black male who was basically seen as a big black brute, or he was seen as this minstrel who was out here primarily there just to entertain whites. So instead of seeing black as having a value 
in and of itself. In most cases, what you had from slavery were black folks who were conditioned to see themselves through the eyes of white people. And they didn't want to see intellectual aspects as something they could pursue because they were taught, oh, this is not something you should go out here and pursue. And this is not something that is considered black. And the reason why it's not considered black is because it's not something that's going to get me any sort of social favor with the slave master and it's not going to get me any sort of social acceptance from the slave master. So that's where the root of it started, and we started to see it again come up during the days of Jim Crow, and it really got worse as time went on and we started to get into integration, and we don't really see intellectual blacks as having a value in the black community because most black folks, sadly, are looking for that social acceptance from those white people, and they want to get themselves into that black box and into those roles that they believe will quickly garner them the attention of these white people. And if they, that's why they want to put on these roles. Um, thank you, Trey Rob Eastside. Um, glad to see you from Los Angeles. Thank you for the super chat. Um, but when I listen to David Carroll and I listen to him, again, talking about this cloud, this is not just a cloud. This is a spell over the minds of black people. And this spell has them thinking, oh, I, ha this is, I have to become the kind of black that's acceptable to white. And if I I'm not a real black person, unless I am playing a certain type of role. And when they see white people giving, paying attention to certain black people, that's when you have some black people out here and they're thinking this is going to get them the attention and approval from white people. So that's why you're gonna see a black woman acting like a loud mouth with an attitude, neck rolling and eye snapping because that's getting her attention from these whites and these non-blacks. And you're also seeing a lot of these black guys running around with sagging pants and Air Jordans. They, they, they wanna fit in, they wanna be accepted. And they feel that this, putting on this character and persona will get them that attention from white people. And the reason why they don't like the intellectual black man is because the intellectual black man and black woman, because not just the black man, because in Spellbound, Matilda was dealing with this as a biracial black woman. She was also dealing with this as well. If you're not playing the roles, many of these black folks become extremely insecure. And they become insecure because they're scared that you're a threat to them getting attention and they want to get that attention for themselves. And they also don't want anybody upsetting the apple cart as related to the white folks. They don't want to scare the, the good white folks because if they see somebody not acting in line, they get really angry and upset. And that's where a lot of these people will start to get violent. And I ran into that in junior high school and high school all the time. And I know a lot of other people have run into that, um, like black comic fans, black sci-fi fans, a lot of the black goths, they've run into this exact same hostility. And that hostility comes from many of these people scared that they're not gonna be able to get the attention or the approval of the good white folks. So they want to put on this role of being so-called real because they want to be the real black people in the eyes of the white man. Because again, they know they're not only loving this white man and this white woman, they're obsessed with this white man and this white woman. And they're obsessed because they fear that if they don't get this attention from this white man or this white woman, they will not be able to survive in the world. 
And they fear that if you come out here dressed uh, in a different fashion and acting in a different fashion, you're going to threaten their ability to gain that social attention and that social currency with that white person out there. They fear that if you come along and you are presenting a different image of black, they their image of black will not be validated and they fear that if that image of black starts to become one that starts to become the norm, they fear they will become marginalized and they fear they won't be able to survive. That's why you have this dark spell over the black community. You have so many people against black intellectuals and black intellectual pursuits because these people, they are brainwashed into believing that if they don't conform to this kind of black, they won't get white acceptance at all. That's, that's why you have so much dysfunction as related to people being against intellectual pursuits like literature, like the arts, like, again, things like comic books, science fiction, fantasy, things like the goth subculture, things that every kid can go in any other community can go out here and enjoy. If you're a black person and you enjoy these kind of things, you're told that you're acting white, which is a great irony because these are the same people who are trying to become the kind of black that is acceptable to white people. So the greatest irony to me as related to many of these people who are against intellectual pursuits is they sit there and talk about how a person like myself is acting white. But what's funny is, is that they are acting in a way that they believe will be acceptable to white people by being the black that white racists want them to be. Because the whole idea of everybody being from the streets, everybody being from the hood, everybody being about wearing gold chains and bling and lusting after women, like a recent statement by Barack Obama in The Atlantic as related to black men who went out here and supported Donald Trump in the election. These are ideas that came from white racists as related to what black is supposed to be. But when it comes down to a black person forming their own ideas about the kind of black they want to be, they get told that that's acting white. And again, a great irony when you really think about it, because here you have a black person who is not going out here and looking to expand their own knowledge and expand their sense of um, culture and identity. And they're told that this, uh, trying to expand your culture, your identity, and trying to become the person you want to be, you're told you're acting white. But meanwhile, if you put yourself inside of this box and conform to these stereotypical roles, that's considered keeping it real and being a real black person. And again, this is just, the, this is all part of the dark magic of the Spellbound Mind and the Spellbound Mind, which is I talk about in my novel Spellbound, you can pick that book up again on Amazon in paperback and Kindle format. I'm gonna leave a link to it in the chat. You can learn about how this frame of thinking really just, it really jacks up the minds of black people. I mean, some people, they come in again, like the Susie and the Banshee song talks about from the cradle bars comes a beckoning voice that, that tells comes to you and you feel like you have no choice. And a lot of black people feel like they have no choice. They feel like they have to follow this road and in this ragdoll dance entranced. And they feel like they have to walk down this road because they want to be accepted not only by their black peers, but they want to be accepted by these white people uh, who are outside of the community. And they believe they have to become this version of black that they see 
either on the, in their in their household, in their relatives, on the streets, or in things like these movies and TV shows, and they don't think that they can come out of that box, and they fear if they come out of that box, you will be told, you know, that there's something wrong with you, and a lot of black people, they fear that if there's something wrong with them, that people are going to ostracize them and they're not going to be able to get any sort of opportunities at things like employment or things like relationships. They fear they're going to be cut out of things. But the, again, the great irony is, is that you're not, you're not being cut out of things. You're actually missing out on opportunities because the real opportunities are outside of the box and the only way to really grow is to get out of the box. But a lot of black folks, they would rather stay in the black box, which is filled with a lot of ignorance, with a lot of foolishness and a lot of nonsense because they want to go out here and get these brownie points with these white people. And they want to be able to get the attention of a handful of white people that they see on the outside not understanding that if you step out of the box, you will get more attention for just being yourself. And when you step out of the box and you start pursuing, again, intellectual interests, you're going to see a much larger world and you're going to get a larger picture of the world. And you're going to get not only a larger picture of the white world, you're also going to get a larger picture of the black world. And that's one of the things I was grateful for my brother, you know, taking me to places like Forbidden Planet uh, when I was younger and taking me to different places uh, to see different things because that gave me a bigger picture of not only the white world, but also gave me a bigger picture of the black world to see that there was more to the black community than the hood and that there were more different aspects of black life than what was really even presented out here as related to the hood and the streets. And it really opened my eyes to see that there were black people living all different types of life and different types of experiences and different types of cultures. I mean, we, we rarely get to see any of that because many people in the black community, they, they, they think that they have to just fit into this black box and our media is often tries to fit us into a black box. And we that's what we're seeing right now. But I remember growing up in the 80s, you had men like Bill Cosby, you had men like Robert Townsend, you had men like the Hudlin brothers, and many other men like Bill Duke. They were trying to give us a larger world as related to images of black men and black women. And I was really also thankful for growing up and, and experiencing those types of movies that gave me a larger picture of black life and black culture because a lot of people who grew up in the 70s, they only grew up with a handful of stuff like these black exploitation movies and these shows like Good Times and stuff that really did not show you that bigger picture. All they showed you was, oh, black people come from a ghetto. And again, the right supremacist wants you to believe only black people come from a ghetto Black people are poor, black people are miserable, and black people, they're not into anything except music and dancing because they're coming from their ideas of what black is, and they don't want you to come out of that box and see those that larger picture of black culture and the black experience because they want you to stay inside of your box because if you stay in your box, excuse me, the racists feel comfortable because they know they can pigeonhole you into this box where they can just say, oh, this is a black person. We know where to put him because it's safe for us and it allows our world to be a smooth world because as long as this black person is at the bottom in our world, we don't have to worry about this black person challenging anything as related to our world. So a lot of the black folks who buy into, again, this spell and buy into that dark magic 
they, they, they're the people who just wind up limiting themselves. And when you go out here and you buy into these ideas of quote unquote real and let their reality become your reality, instead of you thinking about reaching for the stars, you just think about staying in the hood or staying in your place and you start thinking about staying into the roles that, that were taught to you instead of trying to come out of that box and become something greater and try to become something, someone different. Because again, a person who has intellectual pursuits and is going out here and wants to go out here and do get good grades, wants to learn how to speak properly, and also wants to go out here and pursue other interests. They, they're, they're developing, they're growing, and they're changing. And those changes don't mean that that person is, quote unquote, acting white. It means that that person is growing and developing because they're getting more perspective on the world. And because they're getting more perspective on the world, they are learning that what people call black is not what people put into a box. They're learning that they can go out here and define what black is on their own terms. And that's something I call the darker shade of black. And that's something that your Frederick Douglass did back in the days of slavery when he walked away from the plantation and decided to go up north, and he started his newspaper, The North Star. He was the first, as I see it, to become the darker shade of black because he became the kind of black that was on his own terms during that whole dark period of slavery. And you also had others like Benjamin Banneker, who also was a darker shade of black, again, defining black on their own terms, pursuing their own intellectual interests, and these are black people who decided they weren't going to just sit there and try to fit into somebody else's standard of black. They were going to become their own standard as related to black. And they were going to go out here and create things as related to what they wanted to do as related to being black. And they were not going to let somebody else tell them what black is, especially a racist who wanted to put them into a box and tell them, oh, this is a black person and this is what a black person does. Because in their mind, they only see black people at the bottom. They only see black people as bottom feeders. They see black people as not capable of being able to do anything. And when you buy into that cloud or that dark spell, again, what you do is wind up limiting yourself. And that's what the white supremacist wants you to do is go out here and limit yourself. Because when you go out here and you buy into that dark magic, instead of you seeing yourself reaching for the stars and being number one, you see yourself as number two. And you, when you see yourself as number two, what happens is, you never try to go out here and be the best. And you don't want to be the best because you fear upsetting this white man and you fear upsetting these white people. But these white people are not real white people. These are imaginary white people who are in your mind. And that's something a lot of these people who are buying into the whole anti-intellectual thing and want to be this socially accepted black person do. They want to go out here. They want to get this social acceptance because they fear that upsetting this imaginary white person. And this, this again, this white person is not in the, in the, is the white person out here. This is the white person who's in their minds and they project that on any white person out here and they project that idea onto that white person and they make that into their into a god in some cases as i see it because they don't want to go out here and upset the white person because they they want to be the black 
that's acceptable to, to those white people. But that white person never asked that black person to become that version of black. And many people, they don't really understand that in the black community. They're, they're, they're so afraid of upsetting this white person based on what they have seen in the media, what they've seen in the movies, what they've seen on television. They're afraid of upsetting people, but they don't understand those are scripted stories and scripted images. And you have to become the black that you feel comfortable with. And it's your right to do that in these United States. And I talked about this in Spellbound because again, I grew up in the fascist state of the black community. And in that fascist state run by these black single mothers, the you could not be any version of black except that stereotype. And anybody who tried to go out of that, they were punished severely by these beta enforcers and these black female enforcers who wanted everybody to be that small version of small handful of roles of black that they thought were acceptable to white people. So they did, they wanted, they, again, they feared that if they stepped out of that box, they feared being punished, but there was nothing to really be afraid of. And that's something I learned, again, growing up, going outside and seeing the world. There was not, nothing to be afraid of and nothing to really be scared of. You can be whatever you want. And good to see you here as Ken. Um, you can be whatever you want, but you can't tell that to many black folks because many black folks, when they look up at the sky, they don't see the sun. They only see that dark cloud and they only see that dark cloud. And because they only see that dark cloud, that makes them afraid to go out and be the kind of black they want to be. They only want to be the kind of black that's acceptable to white people. And again, these white people are not real white people. These are white people in their minds. So you'll have a lot of black men and women who have a lot of potential. And instead of them going out here to explore that potential, we have others in the black community who want to shame them, bully them, harass them, all because they want to go out here and read, or they want to go out here and work on things like cars and electronics, or they want to go out here and work on computers, they get told that th those aren't quote unquote things that black people do. Those are things that white people do. But these are the same people who buy into the idea that, oh, black people go out here and they smoke weed. They go out here and get up at 6 a.m. to stand outside of a Arab owned store and watch the Arab man make a bunch of money, but they don't think to start their own business because, oh, starting a business is a white thing, but starting a business was not a white thing back when we had neighborhoods like Sugar Hill. Back in those days when we had that whole neighborhood filled with the these million dollar homes at the time, they would be estimated value today of being million dollar homes that, that was, it was considered a, a good thing to have your own business and have success. So this um, is considered, was considered something good back then, but black people today, because they've bought into that dark cloud, they buy into those ideas about, oh, but being black doesn't means you don't have to have, and starting a business is acting white, being black and having a nice, um, home is acting white. That's considered white because people have been brainwashed to, to believe that they have to be one kind of black in order to be accepted. And we shouldn't accept somebody else's ideas about us. And we should not buy into ideas of looking for acceptance of others. And that's something a lot of black people have to really think about um, as related to breaking the spell and that's something I talked about, again, in Spellbound, as Matilda starts to understand about this whole spell over Black people's minds, is that as she starts to break this spell over her own mind, and she starts to see this whole Spellbound mindset in, in her own community, she starts to see that she can be whatever she wants, 
And that's one of the reasons why she becomes a part of the goth subcultures, because she wants to become the kind of black she wants to be. And this whole concept of the black widow, as I designed it, was about her becoming the black that she wanted to be. And she, as she became the kind of black she wanted to be, she incorporated things from the rich history of black women, where she thought about the way the sophisticated sisters used to dress in the, in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. She incorporated that as part of her black widow identity and being the elegant, sophisticated black woman, something that really we don't really value because we tell black girls that they aren't, and with that spellbound mindset, they're, they get taught, oh, you're not beautiful and that you should downplay your beauty. You need to be this masculinized image of being a woman instead of embracing your femininity and embracing black beauty. So this, the whole, there were a lot of different things I put into the book because I understood the cloud over the black community. I understood that this was more than a cloud. This was some dark magic created by your white supremacists. And it was also created by some in the black community because some you have some black folks out here who buy into this dark magic created by these wizards. And you have black people who want this acceptance more than anything because they've bought into this whole codependent mindset and they want this white acceptance more than God himself. I mean, in their minds, a white man is God and they would rather be a white man's court jester than be a responsible black man or black woman because that's why they would rather be a stereotype and a one-dimensional caricature in a white man's world rather than be a multi-dimensional human being who can stand up in the real world. So you'll have these guys out here and they want to, the reason why they hold on to these, ident these caricatured identities is because they wanna fit into that black box and get the attention of those white people and they would rather be this white man's coon or this white man's brute or this white man's thug, or they would rather be this white man's Jezebel or this white man's hood rep rather than be their own polished, intelligent black person who is valued by other black people. And that's what happens when you have the spellbound mind and when you come out of the spellbound mind, what happens is, instead of you looking to seek the acceptance of what you start to realize are imaginary white people, you start seeking the acceptance of the living God. And as you start to accept the living God in your life, you start to see real people as they are. And you start to seek out, again, people who are like-minded and Instead of you seeking to fit into somebody's role, you start to find your purpose under the most high living God. And that's what happens when you break the spell. You start going out here, finding your role in the world, finding your purpose. And what happens is you start to grow and you start to actualize your potential. And this is the cloud that, again, hovers over the black community because so many black folks, they're too afraid to step out on God's promises and they're afraid to step out from under that cloud because that cloud in some ways is like a security blanket. They feel safe under that cloud where they can be these caricaturized roles and they feel like they can get their needs met if they go along and play the role. As long as they play the role and in the box, they feel like they're safe and they know that they're going to, in some ways, be guaranteed at some sort of acceptance. Glad to see you here, Queen Jet Black, um, talking about, again, um, the spellbound Black America. And I was inspired by David Carroll's video, The Cloud Over um, Colored America. And... Breaking that, once you break that spell, you're going to see the world in a completely different fashion. 
And it's going to really open your eyes and you're going to see black people as being limited out here right now. I mean, you're, you're going to see a completely different world and you're going to see black people in a completely different mindset. And you're going to see how limited it is um, as related to what mainstream media presents us as black and what is really out there at, as related to the black community and the black experience. And that's something I try to deliver, you know, to my readers with books like Eternal Night, which is a black vampire story. We don't get that many of these published by mainstream publishers or books like Easting Blast from the Past, which is African-American fantasy. Same thing with Isis and John Haynes. I mean, I try to give people, again, that darker shade of black, that richer black experience. And even when I do books like All About Maryland, I talk about, you know, black actresses in Hollywood. I try to give people a richer and more diverse picture because, I, excuse me, I understand the darker shade of black. And the darker shade of black is about us defining what black is. But in order to get to that darker shade of black, you have to change your frame of thinking. And changing your frame of thinking means coming out of that clouded mindset that is over the black community that tells you that intellectual pursuits are white. No, intellectual pursuits do not have a race or an ethnicity. Striving to, be, to do well in school, striving to speak well, these are not white things. These are things that people do when they want to improve themselves. These are things that people do when they want to take themselves to the next level. And these are things that people do when they want to gain a better understanding of the world. Unfortunately, in the black community, we're taught that pursuing intellectual pursuits is a negative thing. But as I see it, our greatest intellectuals like a W.E.B. Du Bois or Frederick Douglass, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, were they acting white? I mean, I think about Malcolm X, a man who was completely self-taught inside of a prison library, and he, he became one of the most greatest orators in world history. I mean, that shows us that, and that the whole idea of intellect, being an intellectual being a white thing is completely wrong because many black people consider Malcolm X to be one of the most real black people out here, but Malcolm X was completely self-taught and Malcolm X was one of the, again, greatest orators you will ever see. If you ever watch Malcolm X, you can go to YouTube right now and watch Malcolm X speak. And he just, that's a lot of people would, they, they will sit, would they say he's acting white? I mean, I don't see Malcolm X as acting white, and I don't see black intellectuals as something, somebody negative. I see them as a great positive, and they are a tremendous asset to our community. And black people, we need more black people pursuing intellectual pursuits, because the more black people who pursue intellectual pursuits, the more that are going to be out here to shatter that whole dark spell that's over our black community and has black people thinking that the only way to be black as a black man is to be one of these big black guys who's running around here with sagging pants and sneakers looking like an overgrown child or to be a black woman means you have to be one of these hood rats with multicolored weave in our hair and dressed up in tight spandex. Those are not real images of real black men and black women. And those are not images that our grandfathers and great grandfathers had as related to being black. Because our grandfathers and great grandfathers and great grandmothers, they had an image as related to excellence and they wanted us to be the very best. That's why they would always go out here and dress their sons and daughters in the finest suits and ties, starting out even as a little boy. And that's something I was raised with, to dress up in clean clothes and dress up in press clothes. 
and, you know, put on your very best. And that's what we used to have in our black community as a standard. We used to have black men and black women who demanded excellence from our children and our children's great grandchildren, sadly, have lost their way because of this dark cloud of anti-intellectualism that has grown over the black community over the last, I say, 50 years. And as this cr crowd has grown and as this dark magic, as I say from this cloud has grown, we've been taught that being intelligent is not black and being acting and presenting intelligence is white. And again, intelligence doesn't have a color and that's something we really need to learn because when I look at incidents like what happened in that Dallas restaurant, it shows me that we have really fallen a long way as related to standards. Because again, when I was a kid and I was raised, you know, in, as growing up, I was taught that you had to put on your best conduct when you were going outside. And when you were in a place like one of these restaurants, you were supposed to be on your best behavior because it was a not only a reflection on you, but it was a reflection on your family. And you wanted to leave a good impression on people because you wanted people to see the best image of you. So that's what we that's what people were missing out about as related to what happened in that Dallas restaurant where those women were twerking. They didn't understand it really was not about the music because I remember in the year 2000 uh, when I was working at Strive and AmeriCorps Vista, my boss took me to a Spanish restaurant where they were playing loud Spanish music and I didn't see one single Latino in, man or woman inside of that restaurant going to go out here and bust moves based on just the music that they heard. And that's because those Latino men and women had discipline and self-control. And they knew that when you're out here, you're representing not only your um, self, you're also representing the race. And when you're out here they, and people see stereotypical behavior, that just reinforces that idea in people's minds. And that's something a lot of black people aren't really thinking about because they're thinking, oh, if I behave this way, this is considered black because they've been, again, conditioned by your social media to buy into this idea that, oh, twerking is a black thing, acting out in public is a black thing, acting a fool in a restaurant is a black thing, and being a complete idiot in the streets and fighting in the streets is a black thing because when you see so many black images that show you, oh, that black people acting like this, you think that this is normal, but this is not how we were, and this is not how our grandfathers and great-grandfathers were. When it came down to them, they put on their best behavior, and when it came down to them, they wanted us to behave in a way that showed the world that black men and black women could be the very best, and it wasn't about See, about um, proving something to white people. It was about establishing a standard for ourselves. So a lot of people think, thought it was about, oh, it was about black people trying to prove something to white people. But once you take the cloud off your mind, you see that it was about us creating our own standard. And that's what was created in places like your Sugar Hill in Harlem. We were creating and building our own communities with our own standards, and those standards were all about excellence. Same thing with towns like your Black Wall Street and your Rosewood. They were all about Black excellence, and Black people were told, oh, that's not what we're supposed to strive for. And again, we're told this by racists who don't want us to strive for this because they don't want to compete with us. And if they've got you in this box, that's acceptable to them, then what happens is, instead of you striving for excellence, what you do is sit there and try to be whatever black they want you to be. And again, their idea of black is about keeping you 
at the bottom of the world while they continue to strive to rise for the top. And yes, they might let one or two bootlicks come up as related to creating some carrot that they can dangle over the black community and have them chase. But the whole thing is you're chasing somebody else's standard instead of going out here and creating your own. And that's something that no, that many of these racists don't want black people to do. And that's why they wanna keep this cloud over the black community as related to black intellectuals. And they wanna keep that cloud over it because as long as you're seeing darkness and you're not seeing anything to hope for, anything to aspire for, or anything to try to strive for, and instead of you seeing a light at the end of the tunnel, all you see is an endless road of darkness. All you see are Pookies and Ray Rays going to jail. All you see are Pookies and Ray Rays in the graveyard. And all you see are a whole group of baby mamas. Instead of you seeing black excellence, you're seeing black failure. And they want you to see black failure because black failure is something that they consider acceptable to them. That's why they always make the movies and the literature always featuring images of black people either dying or going to prison because they want to associate black with failure. But once you take a step towards the road of the darker shade of black and start defining black on your own terms, you start to see black and associate it with success and you start to see black and start associating it with achievement. And that's what black people really need to understand about why into black intellectuals are important and why the black intellectual mindset is important because it's about us taking ourselves to the next level and not us sitting there and looking to wait for some great white savior to finally acknowledge our good and then want to go out here and try to elevate us because any elevation that a white person would give you, again, would only put you in a second best position or a third best position in their world. And why should you accept second best when you can be number one in your own mind and you can meet God's standard and meet what God's purpose is for your own life? That's something a lot of black folks really aren't thinking about as related to things because they still, again, have this dark spell over their minds and they're still thinking, oh, I, I need to be, in order for me to make any sort of thing in the world, I need to be the black that's acceptable to white people. And if I'm this black, uh, that's number, I can become number one as related to the white man, but that number one will always be number two because he's never going to let you become number one overall. And the only way for you to become number one is to go out here and find God, find God's gift, get Jesus' gift of salvation, and then let him put his spirit in you so you can start doing his so you can start doing his work in your life and you can start to become what he wants you to be. Instead of you becoming what the white supremacist wants to be as number one, which is just a joke, you become and defined by God and you start to become somebody who's on a higher level and a higher place. And it may not appear to be popular with white people on the mainstream, but you will find, again, value and purpose. And that's something a lot of black people never get to because they're taught, oh, and, and intellectualism is white, but they don't understand that what they're trying to sell you as black is not really black. It is something that a racist made up as his idea of what black is. And it is an idea that he made up that he believes is what he wants black people to be and not what we made of ourselves. So you have to get your mind right again, because as I saw it, the cloud over black America is again, dark magic as I see it. And again, I talk about this in my novel Spellbound because the Spellbound mindset has you believing that again, there's only one way to be black and this one way to be black is not something that we ever made up. I mean, did we make up the ghetto? Did we make up 
the streets. Did we make that stuff up? No, we did not make that stuff up. And when you start looking at history and you start looking at great neighborhoods in Harlem, like Harlem's Sugar Hill, you start to see that we can make a great neighborhood that's on the level of a Fifth Avenue. We can do things like Black Wall Street and make a great town. And possibly we could have built that into a great city. And we can go out here and make something of ourselves. And we don't need to go out here and fit into somebody else's box and be their first black whatever. We can be our own black um, whatever we want to be. And we can get that value by saying we're who we are. I mean, you'll have people who will be celebrating, oh, he's the first black um, attorney general or he's the first black so-and-so. It's like, that means nothing because all your, the only reason why you're celebrating him is because white people have said that he is good or she is good. But how about all these other black people who go out here and work hard? I mean, in our black community, because we have so many people with this spell mall mindset, they celebrate people going to jail because they want to get, again, white acceptance because in the mainstream media, they love celebrating Pookie and Ray Ray. But the brother who comes out of college, he's practically ignored. And he's ignored because many people are caught under this dark spell and because they're caught under this dark spell and this dark magic they don't see the value of the educated black man or the educated black woman who is self-aware they don't see a value in those people because those people they don't see them as people because in their eyes that's not quote unquote black it's just like i was talking about last week in that discussion I called what is black because I thought about your Joe Biden when he said, oh, if you don't vote for me, then you ain't black. He was sending a message telling us what he, who he saw as black. And we also saw that with your Barack Obama when he talked about these black male supporters of Donald Trump. And when he talked about them, he talked about how they were into bling, how they were into women and how they were into a hip hop lifestyle. And he really showed how, again, how ignorant he was. I mean, they didn't wanna see, again, intelligent black people as capable of being able to make their own decisions. And I'm no Donald Trump supporter. I don't like Donald Trump at all. But the whole thing is, you were, he was trying to put black people into a box that was acceptable to white people. And he wanted to show us, excuse me, the black that he thought was black. And in his mind, a black person was somebody who listened to what they call hip hop, because that really was not hip hop. We're talking about bling and women. Anybody who grew up with rap music in the late 70s and the early 80s, we know that rap music was originally about teaching black empowerment. Black rap music was about teaching black pride and rap music was originally about teaching black people to value who they were. And the whole message of rap music was hijacked by your groups like your minstrels with attitude who went out here and started talking about straight out of Compton and creating these stereotypes that were acceptable to white people. And they turned rap music from what it originally was, which was again, originally about black empowerment and then evolved into, again, very positive beats about being about strong wordplay and intellectualism. And you had all this diversity as related to Pan-Africanism. It was, it, was, it was a completely different experience than what people know. And you can go on YouTube and check out all those old 80s rappers and you'll see a completely different take on it from the 80s, from the late 80s with NWA and the West Coast and the 90s, you'll see that rap music was a completely different thing, but he wanted to see it as basically big booty women, bling, and again, creating a stereotype that fit his version of black because he didn't see a black man as intelligent because in his mind, they're the only intelligent black man that was supposed to be in the room were supposed to be guys from the boule like him, again, wanting to fit people into boxes and making those boxes acceptable to
to white people, but never wanting to come out of those boxes and seeing black men like myself who can create um, different types of stories and can speak and articulate an argument like I am right now. I mean, according to many of these guys out here who buy into the idea of what is quote unquote the spellbound version of black, I would not be considered what they consider to be the mold of black. And for them, I'm so called quote unquote acting white. And a lot of those people, they want that because they don't like the idea of a black person like myself who can speak for himself. And they don't like the idea of a black man who can actually stand there and go toe to toe with them. And they don't like the idea of a living, breathing person who refutes all of their stereotypes about being black. And they don't like the idea of seeing black people like myself because that means you have to actually deal with an actual black person who can actually not only refute your arguments by being there, but can also present their own arguments about being black and present their own definition about being black. These are the things that make many of these racists uncomfortable seeing a black person like myself who can stand and speak for themselves this is what makes them uncomfortable, and that's what makes them uncomfortable about the whole idea of black intellectualism, because you have actual living, breathing black people out here who can stand up and represent what an intelligent black person is and not be whatever stereotypes that many of these racists find comfortable. So that's the thing that they don't like about black intellectualism, and that's the, one of the things that's related to the cloud over black America, and as I see it, spellbound black America, they want to keep black people spellbound because the whole idea is they want the black people to stay in the box that's acceptable to them and have their smooth world. And when you have black people who are living, breathing, and presenting real life people who are actual people, that's something that they can't stand because that's someone that actually is showing that you can not, uh, they're only a living, breathing person, but they're also showing that there's a different type of black out there and that you can aspire to be a different type of black other than the handful of stereotypes that are out here as related to black people. So when they start to see, you know, black people like myself, you know, your black comic fans, your sci-fi fans, your goths, your computer guys, that, that makes a lot of the racists uncomfortable. And what's even sadder is you've got some guys who think that they have to bootlick in order to get acceptance, but you shouldn't have to do that because you are who you are and your version of black is just as val valuable as anybody else's version of black. And you have a right to be the kind of black that you wanna be because again, in this, in this United States, according to our Constitution, we were supposed to have the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And why should a black person have to fit themselves into a box? Because that's a complete betrayal of our Constitution, which is supposed to guarantee us life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, why should a black person be miserable playing the role of a pookie, a thug, a mammy, or a menstrual when they can go out here and be whatever they want to be. I mean, why should you limit yourself to fitting into somebody else's world when there's a whole world out there for you and you can go out here and be whatever you want to be? I mean, that's the thing that really messes with a lot of black people's minds as related to this cloud. They, they, they just, they feel like they're so limited and they feel like they have to go out here in order to be black. They have to be in these boxes and they have to go out here and fit into these stereotype roles, but that's not the case at all. And once you start to open your eyes and start to open your mind, again, you start to see that you can go, you can break out of the black box that's acceptable to white people. And you can start to see a richer and larger world. And you can start to see other black people in that larger world 
and you can start to see that you actually have freedoms out here and those freedoms have always been there. And that's one of the things about black folks is that they, they're, even though they have been free, the fear keeps them from going out here and breaking free and going out here to find and discover what they want to be black. And they're told, oh, there's all, you can only be a handful of black things, but the whole thing is you have a right to go out here and find out what black is and what black is to you. Now, I'm going to get ready to wrap up tonight's stream. And before I wrap up tonight's stream, we want to get the likes up. Um, we have 49 and it's 46. Let's get that up to 49. And I want everybody, you know, I've been talking about Spellbound. It's a, gr it's a great book. People love it. So, um, so I wrote this book so that black people would understand um, the whole spellbound mindset and being limited. So it's a book that I wrote to give people a better understanding about all of these bullies in, in, in the black community and these p urban terrorists and how they keep you from becoming yourself and limiting, how they limit you and how you can break free from those limitations and become who you truly are. It's a book that will transform your life. And it's a book that I, I think everybody should take a look at. And when I was thinking about, again, David Carroll's um, video, The Cloud Over Colored America, I immediately thought of my novel, Spellbound. So it's a book I definitely want you guys to go out here and pick up. I also have some other books that um, I'm, I published this for the SJS Direct 2020 Fall Catalog. I have Eternal Night, which is a black vampire novel. And this is one that I wrote because I know there's a lot of black horror fans out there. And I wanted to create a black horror story that was set in the SJS Direct universe. And I wanted to, again, bring more diversity to black people as related to horror stories, because we really don't have that many out there. So I wanted to do this one. And this one, people love this book, Eternal Night. And this one is on Amazon right now. And you can get this one, Eternal Night. in paperback and you can also get it on Kindle Unlimited over the holiday season and this one is again a, a, is a black vampire story it's set in the black partially in the black church and I wrote this one again to open black people's minds to you know exploring different types of genres of fiction because when it comes down to black fiction usually we get a single successful educated black man, black woman who can't find a man the swirling books the street books but at SJS Direct, I want to bring diversity to people. And I do that through books like Eternal Night, which is, again, a black vampire story. And I also have the other books of the SJS Direct 2020 catalog. John Haynes, The Man with Nothing to Lose, which is a part of the John Haynes series. And one of the more popular books in the SJS Direct catalog. And I also have Isis, The Main Event, which also is the goddess next door and she steps into the wrestling world. And I have E-Steam Blast from the Past where Hell's Aspiring Angel takes on a her demonic doppelganger and his follow-up to E-Steam and Sands of Time. This is a great book to give to your kids because it features the first comic that's coming from the SJS Direct imprint. And I wanted people to get a preview of what an SJS Direct comic would look like because I'm planning on doing a comic in the future and this is the kind of story I would do in comics. This is also available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle format. And it's a, excuse me, a great gift for your kids. And all the SJS, all these SJS Direct books, so the SJS Direct Universe books are accessible for all ages. Um, they're, they're great for young readers and they'll help them develop their vocabulary because that's how I learned how to, you know, be able to speak as well as I am. I, I read a lot of comic books back in the day and that helped me a lot. And that's one of the reasons why I go out here and write different books like the ISIS series and the East team series is because I want people to be able to develop their vocabulary and their reading skills. So And 
Blast from the Past is available on Amazon right now. Um, it's got its first five star ranking, and that's the, the fastest I've ever seen an SJS Direct book get a five star ranking. Um, so that that book is 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 starting to get some positive feedback. Eternal might have some positive feedback, and so you also get the man with nothing to lose. And I'm gonna put the link to the main event in the chat. So. I have a lot of great books and on Amazon right now. I also have books like the Simp series and the Man Crisis. And all of these books are available on Amazon.com right now. You can pick them up on you can pick them up on Amazon.com right now in paperback and Kindle format. You can also find some of them on Smashwords, Google Play, and the iBookstore. And if you want to see me make more live streams like this, um, you can donate to the Cash App or the Patreon, and that would be greatly appreciated because that's how I stay on the air. And I really enjoyed doing tonight's stream because, you know, I, I think about what David Carroll has broken down in that brilliant video. And again, I wanted to do a response, but I was just so busy. So I had to do a live because what he was presenting is something I grew up and lived with. And it was something that I put in my novel Spellbound because I wanted people to understand, you know, this whole cloud of anti-black intellectualism and this cloud that makes people think that being intelligent and, and is not a black thing and has them buying into ignorance and thinking that ignorance is black but the great irony is, is that this whole statement of ignorance being black comes from a white supremacist mindset. And when you're doing this, you're actually doing and living the way the white supremacists want you to live because the white supremacists want you to be a caricature of a black person and fit into their world and be a clown in their world. And you, there's more to life than being a clown. You can become far more than that if you go out here and learn the darker shade of black and define who you truly are. And that's what I try to do with books like Spellbound is show you how to break out of that black box, stop trying to be accepted by white people and start finding your own road to being black. I'm hoping that's what everybody learned from tonight's stream. And I hope you'll be there for next week's stream.